Hi, greetings from Kyoto, and good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, and for some late night. Uh, as I start this uh, very important panel discussion on conversational AI in low uh, and in low resource settings and low income settings, let me first give you a perspective on this and uh, how we build up this session. So while we were conceptualizing this very important topic of conversational AI, I did reach out to a lot of my friends who have long time been in digital health. And uh, I must put this through this forum that a few of them weren't aware of this topic, and which was a big surprise for me. So I think it makes this session all the more important and relevant, because conversational AI is basic digital health. I mean, this is something that we need uh, for the fact that AI is all pervasive, is getting into every aspect of healthcare delivery. And more than that, what I call is the 80-80-80 rule. 80% 80 of the people don't have access to healthcare or qualified doctors. 80% uh, of the uh, areas that we have do not have anything that they can call as healthcare. And 80% uh, of the problems people have are treatable by probably OTC medications or uh, non-specialist doctors. And uh, that's where I think our role comes into very importantly. And uh, if we have to talk about affordable and accessible healthcare, conversational AI is important. While I was serving the uh, Union Health Minister as advisor, I think my boss was very clear, let's not force doctors to go to rural areas because they have studied in uh, urban cities for better life, better conditions. And uh, rural areas don't provide that infrastructure. So even if they go there, what they will do? I mean, coming from that um, reality, uh, from a country which is of a large population of 1.4 billion, and knowing the effect of what most of these LMICs pass through, I must also relate one experience I had with uh, one of the country heads of IGF who came to our booth and just asked me a question. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about generative AI. Will it solve our healthcare problems? And my immediate instant response was, generative AI is based on data. We do not have that. What will it analyze? So if you're having a very high expectation of saying that generative AI will immediately solve problems, I'm sorry to say that there has to be a baseline of data, there has to be a baseline of clean data for generative AI to work on. So while there is hope and hype, there is a long journey ahead for all of us. So with that having said, I also must give you a very interesting example of conversational AI, which is actually chatbots, uh, AI-based chatbots. So in my book, I do mention about this example that there is a very, um, uh, what do you call, highly respected exam that doctors aspire to pass through. It's called MRCGP in the UK, member of the Royal College of Physicians. The conversational AI chatbots, they scored 81% compared to human physicians who scored 72%. So I think the evidence is around that there is a future of conversational AI. In fact, there is a present, if we deploy it very well, what, what conversational AI can do. But what we need to create is awareness because so-called uh, LinkedIn leaders of digital health didn't actually know about it when I reached out to them. They're all friends. But today, those whom you have on the screen are the actual leaders who understand. Those who are sitting next to me, Dinu and uh, Shauna, so what we are going to do today is to ask people their experience, their expertise, and their expectations from conversational AI. And with me, I have uh, Dinu Cataldo Delasio, who serves as the Chief Information Officer of the UN Joint Staff Pension Fund and leads the UN Digital Transformation Group. Besides, he has many accolades, but I will just point the one that he got was the UN Secretary General's Award for his work in applying blockchain technology for digital certification of entitlement process of the United, UNI uh, JSPF beneficiaries and retirees. Mr. Samir Pujari, who is uh, among many hats he wears, leads the AI at WHO and is the chair of AI for Health at WHO IT focus group. But besides that, he has done a number of things, including Be Healthy, Be Mobile, which is uh, first mobile app from WHO you know, for chronic diseases. 
we have Sabin Dima. Uh, I think we all in the world of AI and blockchain, I would personally have the highest hope from him, given the fact that he's the first person in the world to merge AI and blockchain together. The founder and CEO of humans.ai. And he's an entrepreneur who started his first social media at the age of 16. And if you hear him, I, I bet you that it will change your perspective on what AI and blockchain can do. Uh, we have Atisha Treja. He's a doctor, he's a gastroenterologist. He's currently the CIO and the chief digital health officer of UC Davis Health. And he's done pioneering work for digital health. And at least the reason I got him here, he had done phenomenal work during COVID with chatbots, the conversational AI. We have Mavish Vaishnav, the group CEO of Digital Health Associates, who sits on various government committees for digital health. I've been a part of the UN initiative of the Uber Innovation Working Group Asia, where she drafted the roadmap for telemedicine way back in 2013. We have Dr. Olubisi Ungabase, who is a pediatric doctor and quality improvement team lead and mentor. And I've seen her work at the World Health Organization. She's phenomenal and fantastic work that she has done. So what I'm going to do is pass this to my expert panel for their opening remarks on what have they to say about the conversational AI for low income and low resource settings. So I'm going to start with Mr. Dinu Cataldo. Dinu, over to you for your views on this topic. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gupta, for inviting me to participate in this very relevant, very important discussion and topic. So as you uh, kindly introduced me, my background is in uh, practical implementation of technologies such as blockchain, such as biometrics, specifically facial recognition, for digital identity. Having designed and implemented a solution for the United Nations Pension Fund, to support the proof of existence of 84,000 retirees and beneficiaries of the UN residing in 192 countries. So my initial thought uh, in addressing the challenges that um, conversational AI and chatbot can have and can present in settings with low resources is indeed, and of course I admit my bias here, is first and foremost the identification of the user. As we are looking at potential use cases, we cannot avoid to appreciate the importance that, especially in the healthcare sector, when and if there is a relationship between a patient and a system using this term in a broad sense, that it's intended to provide services, that it's intended to provide supported information, it's critical that the system has the capability to identify who is the end user. Because as we can imagine, the response will need to be tailored and aligned with the specific needs and expectation of the end user. So here comes the concept of having multiple technologies that working together can create a system and a solution that ultimately is able to address the needs of the end user. So the proposition here is, as we discuss in other panels, is here we have the AI, which is a probabilistic technology jointly working and functioning with a blockchain, which is a, a deterministic technology. And the two of them, in conjunction, they can complement each other and provide that level of support to provide and to offer to confirm certainty about identity, certainty and reliability about the data that ultimately the machine learning model are using to elaborate the responses in the conversation. So I think we can start framing the conversation, the discussion, at least from my point of view, by looking at how the joint functioning of this technology can ultimately create a value and a secure solution for the end user. Thank you. Thank you, Dinu, and I think uh, this is this is Dinu's call to everyone that those of us 
who believe in leveraging AI for health, or for that matter, any, any critical sector, please ensure that the probabilistic technologies have a denominator of deterministic technology. So AI in isolation is probably going to create more distrust unless you start merging it with blockchain. I think this is where this panel is clearly having top global experts who have done uh, groundbreaking work in terms of trying to get both these technologies working together. And in health, we always say, you know, that anything you do, the first thing that the user looks at is, is with distrust. And when you start saying that, no, those, this technology has a basis of using, of ensuring an identity and reliability, and that cannot happen without blockchain. And this brings me to my next panelist who is, I think for many years that I have known him, is today the man on the mission, the man who leads AI for WHO and the WHO-ITU collaboration. Beyond that, he knows beyond AI, I mean, given his work in mobile health and other standards, negotiating with maybe 194 countries for getting people on board for this uh, emerging technology. Samir, I want to want ask you, like, what has been your experience? What is your vision? What's the work you are doing in this area? And what can gen uh, this conversational AI deliver for the LMICs? Over to you. Thank you, Rajendra, and thanks um, for sitting on this forum. I think it's a very interesting discussion, especially at two angles. One is the, the conversational AI, because the discussions have floated very much towards just generative AI. I think there are two different components to it uh, that needs to be discussed. And second is the low middle income settings. I mean, that's the key here that we'll discuss. Let me step back and say before I go into my experience part that often in this technology forums, we focus a lot on technology. I would urge everyone to start, take off that hat and think of people. I think it's very, very important that any discussions we are doing are focused on the people. That, that they are getting the benefit out of. And these are not one set of people. These are the future generations that we're looking at. These are the current population that we're looking at. These are care providers that we're looking at. Everyone has a role and impact in this, this area of work with AI and conversational technology. So I think technology has to be understood as an enabler. That's the first part. Now, second point going in, is it really making an impact? Is What is the challenge and how we're looking at it? Right, you mentioned at the beginning of the session that there are gaps in healthcare services. Even in 2023 today, we are still seeing a massive gap in rural, uh, rural Africa where women cannot be screened. It's very expensive to screen for cervical cancer. We are seeing in Egypt massive gaps in screening of diabetes population. And these are problems which are not existent because of, of gap in um, in access to healthcare, but there is a gap in the healthcare providers opportunity. So technology provides that, that specific enabling factor, especially the conversational AIs. We are even not there at the stage of, of population health components, sexual reproductive health areas. We are still missing those massive uh, outreach components with the healthcare gaps. Forget the part of health education and those things, they're way forward. And I think that's where the role of conversational AI is critical. It has been shown through science that in the low middle income country settings, with the technology getting cheaper, there is a potential that these technologies can make a difference across different disease areas in a very effective manner. And our Director General mentioned that very specifically in the July launch of the Global Initiative of AI for Health. However, we have to be very, very careful of four areas. First is equity. Um, and I think that's where the main component comes into play is in when you're trying to deploy technology in low middle income country settings, the business value for this is much less. And hence it is us as this forum or the civil society groups or the international development groups who need to be cognizant that we are working in ensuring equity. The technology companies are not going to be pushing for that. I think that's one part that everyone has to focus on as we look forward. The second part is collaboration. It's extremely important that we work together across sectors for health, education, and different areas and domains of, of, of work. Third is focus on sustainable business models. It's very exciting to trigger a new product, a new project, and go to the field. And 90% of the times I've seen it die 
because it doesn't get it doesn't have a sustainable business model. So that's a very important component. And the fourth point is looking at how it benefits the user at the end of the table. That's the most important. How can you take this AI to the people? That's the discussion that has to be ha happening all throughout. And I think if we can focus on this around the people-centered approach, the people focus, we can make an optimal impact with conversational AI in the changing of the healthcare domain across the SDGs indicators, not just the healthcare indicator, but across SDGs. I think that's the key. I think I would like to see this forum and the members of this in their own role focus on. We have uh, what you asked me at the end of what we're doing, uh, WHO together with ITU and the World Intellectual Property Organization, heads of the three agencies, announced a global initiative on AI to bring together all this work to kill the verticalization or to reduce the vertical, verticalization so that we can work on WHO side providing the guidance standards policies, on the facilities side bringing all the groups together, and then actually helping countries implement that member states level through the the right governance approaches that we have. So I think at this stage, I'll summarize uh, by saying that there's a huge potential in the healthcare market that our member states are seeing and as they're asking WHO to work towards that direction. However, as the UN body, we need to ensure that the member states do not get hit by the private sector business models, but we can benefit everyone in the private sector in terms of, of maximum value of uh, AI in healthcare. Thank you. Back to you. Thanks, Samir. And really heartening to hear uh, what most of the people refrain from saying is that we should not get trapped by private sector business models. Uh, at the same time, we have some phenomenal people in private sector. And I think to your point of people benefiting, we have next uh, Mr. Sabin Dima, who is the founder and CEO of Humans.ai. I really like his approach and the way he's building the AI verse is that he says, you will be able to do anything you can think about with AI. I mean, it is totally disruptive approach that Sabin has. Sabin, it's nice to have you. I know you are traveling. Would like to hear your views given the work and I would like you to maybe speak for a minute about the work that you have done in this field and how you are disrupting and what do you see as the role of conversational AI in healthcare? Over to you. Hello everyone, thank you so much uh, for this uh, for this opportunity. I agree with uh, Mr. Samir that we need to have a human uh, driven approach. So I'm Sabine Dima, I'm the CEO and founder of humans.ai. We are for more than 40 years in the AI field. Uh, in this new AI uh, era, we are a company that already have uh, some world premieres. We created the first AI counselor of a government. Um, we created an AI that is able to have co a conversation in real time with 19 million of uh, Romanians and all of those opinions, we are using them to train an AI. And on the other side, the decision makers can have a conversation with one entity, with one AI, like they're talking with 19 million um, of, of Romanians. Um, we strongly believe that artificial intelligence is the greatest tool ever created. And in order to democratize it, we created an AI framework uh, that make it, make it so easy to create a narrow AI. I don't think that AI is able to replace humans, but it's able to replace some skills. And we can help uh, with that, but we're taking in consideration two major aspects. One is the data. And for that, we created the first blockchain of artificial intelligence in order to have the data traceability to create what it's called explainable AI and to make sure that if I'm giving an opinion to this governmental AI, the AI will, will, will be trained with my opinion as well. And there is no bad actor that can delete that, that uh, opinion. And the other one, it's ethics. We had a lot of research papers on ethics in AI. The latest was presented at uh, uh, Imperial College in, uh, uh, in London. Regarding the AI in healthcare, for sure, AI is going to democratize access to health but I see a bi-directional uh, approach. Usually we are using conversational AI to get answers. We are interacting with the AI. We are asking questions to the AI, but everybody wants to solve people problems, but I think we are not aware 
about those problems. So we should engage in a conversation with people in a human-like interaction like we're having right now to understand what are the people problems and probably the most important, what is the, what is the sense of urgency? And for that, we are not required, we are not asking governments to invest in infrastructure. We are not asking for governments to invest in uh, hospitals and so on. We need just an internet connection. And in some cases, there are some AI models so efficient that can be encapsulated in a, a blow entry tablet and we can ship it in remote places. So I think that we should build this bi-directional conversation to ask people to be aware of what are their problems. And on the other side, to encapsulate different doctor skills, being able um, to, to respond and to create this open innovation platform, that it's a living over organism, that any startups can participate and can bring different skills under the same uh, core. Thank you, Sabin. Uh, coming to Mevish, Mevish, you have been in this field, uh, writing policies and uh, roadmap for telemedicine, and now this new field of uh, conversational AI. And given the fact that you are involved in academia, which is expected to show the roadmap for the future to those who are into this field, what's your view about conversational AI? Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Hello, everyone. I'm Mevish Vaishno, the Group Chief Operating Officer at Digital Health Associates and Academy of Digital Health Sciences. I thank the DC Digital Health for this extremely important session. While we talk about generative AI and large language models like LLMs, I would say that the basic and the disruptive point for LLMs and for generative AI would be the conversational AI. Just imagine a scene where billion people are speaking and billions of people talking to patients, populations, speaking about health issues and clinicians addressing them. It would make a phenomenal opportunity to analyze these conversations and create the GHAI, that is the Generative Health Artificial Intelligence, which would be different from artificial intelligence for general purposes because health is very technical, it is clinical. So I see a great opportunity of conversational AI being the starting point for the generative health AI, which will over time kind of eliminate the need for using doctors for basic health problems, because most of the people in the rural settings or in the saving areas or even urban areas have the need for basic information. And this can be handled by conversational AI, which is driven by either generative health AI but both are dependent on each other. Without this data, we actually cannot do anything. So I see a phenomenal opportunity. And I think we should build upon this. Thank you. Thanks, Mavish. Uh, moving from what you said is the generative health AI and the fact that when people start interacting over voice, over communication rather than texting or writing, which limits their ability, you know, as uh, I'll not call it illiterate, but digitally illiterate population who have not actually will learn to, you know, write still. I mean, that's a major part of the population. In fact, yesterday at a panel, we were talking that 2.6 billion people are still not connected to the internet. And with what Sabin was saying, you know, of shipping the tablets to low resource setting, I mean, just imagine if people start talking, you know, the quantum of data that comes out is going to be exponentially more than what we have today because today you have to type, you have to text, that gets captured for analysis. The moment you start analyzing voice-based data is going to be exponential than what we have. So I think the accuracy will agree, uh, increase and that may become much more worthwhile. But I think at this point, I would like to bring Ashish Chatreja, the actual person who has done a lot of work in this during COVID and even earlier. Ashish, what has been your work in this field and how do you see this field shaping up and the role of conversational AI? Over to you. Uh, Dr. Gupta, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for having me. Uh, greetings from California. It's 1 a.m. here uh, and really excited about this. Uh, we just launched the largest network in the United States uh, on generative AI in healthcare called Valid AI. And the reason being, uh, just very brief background about me, uh, I did my medical school from India. 
and then came to US to do public health and then informatics. Uh, so as a physician, I've been practicing for the first 10 years of my life. And now as an informaticist technologist, supporting technologies uh, for University of California Health and now working globally in many things. I still am a junk professor in medical school in India. So a lot of, I'm considered as an app doctor because I started building apps around 15 years ago. Uh, and these were mostly uh, deterministic models. So we took the rules from the guidelines and the biggest gap we see is, and very eloquently expressed by the previous speakers, there is efficacy which we see from the medicine, what is possible today, like 99% of patients blood pressure can be controlled with the current medicine. But the real gap, which Dr. Gupta mentioned is 80, 80, 80. Many patients don't even get access to the doctor. They can't even drive to a doctor. The doctor has a waiting list. And even if the doctor prescribes a medicine, they do not have time to explain how to take it and how to do other things like salt reduction and others. So there's a biggest difference in the care which actually patients get in their home and then what is possible. And that is because the most of the human medical care globally, whether it's United States or Africa or India, is because we have locked medicine and care into the same time and the same space as a physician. So it's everything has become physician-centered. You have to come into the same clinic or a hospital to get care. What generative AI and AI can do finally is unlock care with the time and space. So you can provide care anywhere you can. And you do not need a physician. You can extend beyond one-to-one -one physician centered care to what we call as exponential one-to-many care. If I have to tell the same thing about blood pressure control, I can make myself into a conversational AI bot. Now with generative AI within a matter of weeks, and I can deliver not only to people, which I see in University of California, I can deliver across California, across US, but really I can now deliver across globally, right? So any solution now we can make, if that is validated the right way, can immediately become a global solution. So we are finally at the cusp of unlocking the biggest supply demand issue in healthcare by democratizing it completely. And if you really combine the converse, the rule-based stuff, the guidelines to provide rule-based care through text-based, you can then combine that with generative AI probabilistic. You're unleashing the, the science of rule-based care with the conversation which patients need. Because rule-based care is our scientific way of physicians doing it, but conversation is the way how patients get it. And that has always been a barrier how to bridge it. But now with combination of these two technologies, we call it a hybrid AI, you can combine the physician-centered care traditionally with patient-centered care, which everyone needs today globally. So, uh, so really excited about this. We have all the US states now looking at, you know, and, and really we need to go with a problem-centered approach first and really looking at equity. The equity is not just in, inequity is not only in patients, inequity is in countries, in states, and in healthcare organizations. If we do it the right way through collaboration, which, which is really I'm looking for here, we can finally make it the most inclusive, the most democratic way of providing care globally and make them go from digital divide to digital bridge. And I think that onus is on us, not on technology. We humans are the transformation agent to bridge the gap. And, and really, it's a big calling for us to really leverage technology, but put our own DNA and purpose to, to bridge that gap. Thanks, Ashish. Uh, and this is very important of the fact that you launched Valid.ai, I think, at Health in uh, Vegas, I guess it was. As, it, as we are That's here, correct. I think it's going on parallelly. Uh, I, I move to the next uh, expert panelist, uh, Dr. Ola Bessi. She is a pediatric doctor and she has done phenomenal work using uh, WhatsApp and others, you know, in underserved populations. I mean, coming as a clinician like you, Ashish, she has done phenomenal work. So Dr. Olabesi would like to hear about your work and what's your suggestions. And I think you have a presentation, so I'll ask the technical team here to allow you to just share your slides briefly.
Hello. Hello. We can hear you, Doctor Oliver. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, greetings to everybody. Uh, I want to thank you very much, uh, Professor Professor Gupta, for inviting me to this um, forum. So I'm a pediatrician. I work in a general hospi hospital, a maternal and child um, center, and we, and we see children. You know, mothers bring them to the hospital and they go. So we have no contact with them thereafter. So we thought of how do we continue and ensure patient engagement? You know, how do we ensure that they, we still maintain, you know, a, a form of um, interaction when our patients leave us, you know, so that we can prevent relapses and, and what have you. So that was what brought us to, you know, thinking of, um, that was what brought us to thinking of what 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 to do um, when our patients leave us? So and that's how we came about um, digital technology and what to do um, when when they leave us, how to involve them in their own how to involve them in their own care. So we thought of using WhatsApp as a um, we talk we thought of using WhatsApp as the means by which we will communicate um, with our with our patients. Please give me a minute. We, we thought of using WhatsApp. It's freezing. Okay. In what so we sorry, we thought of using WhatsApp in communicating with our patients and you know having that. A relationship with our patients, even when they leave us. So I'll be taking my presentation in this outline, a brief introduction, definition, objectives, and what actually we do, advantages and all. So uh, WhatsApp is a form of um, digital technology where we use tools to maintain that relationship um, that engagement with our patients. So for us, Mobile phones is what we have, and mobile phones is what um, um, the patients also have. So that's the tool of digital technology we're using. So patient engagement um, is how we are involving patients in their own care. And digital means we are using uh, an electronic means to ensure that. So. When we started, our objective was, okay, how can we pass information across to our patients? How can we pass um, notices of what's going on in the hospital to them? How can we educate them beyond the little time? You can imagine in developing countries, there's so many patients. So you don't have that much time engaging with them when they come. So what other means can we use to pass education um, to the patients. And the forum also served as a support system because the mothers themselves engage amongst themselves on that WhatsApp platform. And you know they, they support one another. They ask questions, they share ideas. And those times we just stay as a fly on the wall. We don't say anything. But when they now ask us questions, we can now, um, we can now come in and answer their questions. So there are many advantages to this, to this form of engagement, digital engagement using WhatsApp. For us, it's of, of course, optimizes efficiency. Um, unnecessary visit to the hospital. I mean, we can answer some questions. They don't need to come to the hospital. Um, so um, it improves quality of life. It improves patient safety. It improves health outcomes because we're still engaging with them. We still have that contact and relationship with them. So there are many advantages. So um, as of a um, few days ago, you can see here, there are about 395 um, participants. And this is just one of the WhatsApp platform. Every clinic has a WhatsApp platform, a dedicated WhatsApp platform. So from the picture, we, we talk about um, weight gain and their weight increasing. The mother sent pictures to us about different things about their children. This is one saying the hair on my baby's head, you know, has, has, has gone off, what is happening? There's on the light card granuloma, what's happening to my baby's cord. So they send pictures. So and they 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 type questions, they can send pictures. Sometimes they even send voice notes. Them, doctor, listen to my baby's breathing. I'm not comfortable. Just take it. They send they record the baby's breathing and they send it to us. So we are 
also able to listen to the breathing. We're able to read their text messages. We're able to see the pictures they send. So these are various forums. Then this um, here is showing um, the information. Sometimes it's World Breastfeeding Week, it's World Pediatric uh, Day, it's World Hand Hygiene Day. We are using that forum to educate the mothers on the platform. So these are just examples of, you know, interactions that I picked up from the WhatsApp platform. They ask about immunizations. Well, they ask, my baby has cough. Doctor, what do I do? And I see that we are able to interact with them. Okay, come to the hospital, do this first, um, first aid. Let me see you tomorrow. So we're able to book appointments. We're able to um, see them. So we're, we're able to interact with them. So that is the um, experience that they have. So this is pictures we also send to them. Th this spontaneous is normal. This is how you um, engage better when you are um, positioned better when you are breastfeeding. And this picture on the bottom right is a picture of the rash. So they send us, doctor, look at what's on my baby's skin. What is that? Do I come to the hospital? What do I use? Of course, we don't really um, prescribe on the platform. But we can educate, we can inform, we can say, okay, this we, I need to see you in the hospital. Please come at 10 o'clock. Please come at 9 o'clock. So it's a forum. And these are pictures of their babies that they send on the flat platform. When their babies are six months, they say, this is my baby. I've completed exclusive breastfeeding. They're excited because we've talked about exclusive breastfeeding. So um, they send um, the, the baby's pictures. Like I said to you before, they support one another. So when if somebody is, a baby is one year, a baby is six months, they send the picture. All the mothers are congratulating them. Oh, you've done well. You've, you've breastfed exclusively and all that. We all know here that we're talking about digital health. We're talking about, and breastfeeding is one of the childhood survival strategies. So it's a big thing for us. So in conclusion, I've talked about how at Matana Child um, MCC at Etios in Lagos, we've used um, what the WhatsApp platform as one of the digital tools to um, engage with our patients, even when they have left the hospital. It, the consultation shouldn't stop in the doctor's office. Like the last speaker said, you know, it, it should still continue beyond the doctor so that we can prevent relapses, we can continue to educate and all that. So the key words, in conclusion, the key words are digital patient engagement, digital technology, mobile health, using the smartphones that the doctors have, the dietitians have, the nurses have. And this platform is not doctors. Everybody is there. The nurses are there. The dietitians are there. The social worker. So if the question comes and cons that concerns the nurse, she answers. If it concerns the pediatrician, I answer. Everybody's on that platform. And it's, uh, it's really um, a useful platform for us. So thank you very much um, for listening. Thank you, Dr. Olavisi, and I think this convinces us that if you can use WhatsApp to bring such a change and, you know, you get photographs from your uh, <laughs> mothers, you know, who say that, you know, this is what the jacket looks like after six months. I think uh, one of the things that you pointed that we don't prescribe over WhatsApp, but I think what my friend Dinu, who is sitting on my right, has working on technology with blockchain and what Sabin is doing, I think the moment we are able to put the identity within the system, I think the day is not far when I think a prescription on a WhatsApp may be legal as well. I think that's the day we should look forward. But I think uh, seeing your presentation, your work that you have done, I think low resource settings are the high opportunity settings for conversational AI. I mean, that's what I would say. And this brings me to my uh, next panelist, uh, Shauna Hoffman. Shauna had led uh, global roles at IBM Watson and uh, before that with Dell. Uh, she was revered in this field and she's doing path-breaking work uh, in terms of what she does at Godrail Technology. Shauna, over to you for what uh, conversational AI can do and what you would say in terms of ring fencing, fencing the negatives around conversational AI. Over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta, for having me here today. And Dino, I love sharing the stage with you. There are so many great insights that you have. And uh, I will, I've been in artificial intelligence for almost 20 years now. And I have seen it at its best and I've also seen it at its worst. And uh, when Watson won Jeopardy back in 2011, I knew that conversational AI had actually taken the front seat. 
And so I joined IBM at that time. I led a Watson practice for Watson Legal. And uh, when COVID-19 hit, I was chosen as one of the few to lead our COVID-19 solutions to the marketplace. And we had three. And one of the things I had realized um, after leading an AI practice, that AI wasn't enough. And we needed to be responsible, and that responsibility was tracked and traced through blockchain. And so that was the combination of both our three products that we brought out to the market within the first three weeks of the uh, shutdown were one really important. Remember when we couldn't find masks and we couldn't find gloves, and it was really a challenge to get the PPE across the globe. We had an AI chatbot combined solution with blockchain to track and trace all of the materials. We found over 10 billion within the first 24 hours. And so it was connecting people all over the globe. I will say that AI, one, AI, one of the most amazing things for healthcare is that those individuals who can't often travel to a location to get it to a hospital or get to a doctor, often they have mobile phones. And so conversational AI is extremely important for us to get around the globe so that individuals have an opportunity to get forms of health care. And maybe it's unusual, it's not traditional, but it answers those problems, as our previous guest speaker just said. And I love what you're doing uh, to really bring that, especially to mothers. I've got three kids of my own, and man, did I have a lot of questions when they were little, because uh, every little cough makes you a little scared as to what uh, what's happened with them. So um, other solutions that we worked on, of course, the supply chain and uh, making sure that not only, oddly enough to say, not that doctors are a supply, <laughs> but during COVID-19, they were really lacking in so many of the areas. And so we were able to move doctors around through, again, our chat bot. Uh, the doctors were able to chat to say, hey, we, you know, we're available. We're happy to go anywhere in the globe. And we could connect them with the hospitals that were the most in need. Again, a blockchain solution with AI. Uh, you know, conversational AI has such a potential to bridge the healthcare gap. And I would definitely say there are five that we have um, worked on throughout the years. And uh, I have to say this before I even mention the five. AI has been around since 1956. And the, the newest, most excitement that I've ever seen is really just this past year. And it is when a system that used to cause, cost my clients over $20 million to put in place, uh, that was Watson, is now a conversational AI that is free to the globe. And so we're seeing a lot of hype, a lot of excitement around there. Um, but do know there's a lot of use cases over the past 15 years that IBM Watson has been around that they've really solved a lot of these problems. And so there is a good company to go back to to ask those questions. I don't work for them anymore, um, but there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of us who have that are willing and very willing to share our experiences. Uh, if we were to look at the fives, let me jump into those accessibility that was mentioned by our previous uh, you know, speakers, reaching the remote and underserved populations that lack that access to traditional health care. Again, access to mobile phones, many of them have, although we did talk about earlier um, yesterday, the two points, and you did here too, the 2.6 billion people that don't have access to the internet. We need to fix that to be able to give them an opportunity to be part of this global health system. I love the consistency of AI, so 24-7 availability is my second one. It's extremely important to be able to have doctors, which we've done uh, in the past. So Watson had an opportunity, we, we did a lot, even remote surgeries. That kind of gets into robotics. Again, AI is over 90 different components. Conversational AI is only one of them. You can do remote remote surgeries from one end of the, the world to the other. And so we had some really amazing uh, things that we saw. But again, that 24-7 availability with conversational AI is extremely important. And it is consistent. Um, I will say, so I'm the president of Guardrail Technologies. One of the reasons that we, you know, we, we exist is to put guardrails around AI. AI, as Dino had mentioned, is a probabilistic model. It is not correct 100% of the time. Sometimes it's even really incorrect. Uh, we've been working in the medical space in AI. Um, I've worked a lot with various different hospital systems in the U.S. I just spoke at one about six weeks ago, and we dove in with 30 of their top physicians to figure out what we needed to do to answer the problem of the AI being wrong and the AI hallucinating. 
And it could be very scary that it gives the wrong information and could actually cause death. So we need to be careful. Uh, we have guardrails. We fact check the generative AI. That's part of our program. But make sure that you are fact checking it because it is going to be incorrect. The best systems out there, because it's probabilistic, none are going to be 100% correct because of the way the model is. And you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but we just need to make sure we're adding that extra layer that um, c that confirms that the the that we are fact checking our information. Uh, education. Great educational tool, making sure, as, as you had seen, that the mothers know how to breastfeed their babies, what the different rashes look like. Um, I love this one. Language and cultural sensitivity is one of my top five because AI can be used to be customized to the local, um, local language, the local responses to things. It, it can be really cool. There's an AI out there. I just was talking to one of our previous guests, and uh, he had mentioned that they have a movement program that um, that he was in the midst of going and, and finishing up, we're, we're working on a patent uh, application for. But as an individual moves, the AI can watch the movement and see what possible types of um, medical issues that the individual has. So there's some really good, um, you know, language and cultural sensitivity. But then also from there, being able to take that and say, okay, you know, that's a cultural thing, but then this is just unusual, unique. They may have symptoms for other things. So again, very customizable to the individual. And then my last one, efficient triage, which we can, you know, identify urgent medical, medical issues, not again, 24 seven, not having to wait for a doctor's office to open. So thank you. Thanks, Shauna. This makes it very interesting to first see those who have been into the clinical side have used it at scale. So there's no doubt about the effectiveness. In fact, it's about saving lives. Uh, what I said in the beginning, the three 80s, you know, the 80% have no access, 80% can't afford, but 80% have acute problems. That means they every time don't need to go to doctors. And these are 80 A's, all A's, access, affordability, and acute. So the fourth A would be artificial intelligence, of course. But uh, given the fact that we are DC Digital Health and we believe in uh, tangible outcomes for what we discuss here and that we have taken a topic of conversational AI. So I'll go back to my expert panelists and ask them that if you had a clean slate and given the discussions that we have uh, with our expert panelists, uh, what would you recommend, Dinu, to you in terms of our pathway for the next one year for this field? Thank you very much for that question and also for that uh, call to action. So uh, I think the, the previous uh, um, sharing and comment were uh, extremely uh, relevant. I, I really like um, the observation on human centricity, the distinction that was made about the gaps, how to bridge the digital divide the concept of guardrails that uh, Sharna just mentioned. And so here again, uh, I, I like to talk from personal experience. Uh, I've been working for the United Nations for 22 years. And my background is actually in auditing. For a large part of my career, I was the chief IT auditor of the United Nations before becoming the CIO of the UN Pension Fund. So I have a professional deformation on, uh, on assurance, on evidence. And I think that one of the implicit concepts that, if I may, all the speakers of this panel have touched upon, but we have not yet made it explicit, is the concept of trust. In order to have attention to human centricity, in order to bridge the gap, in order to enable uh, the human being to approach, to make use of, to be supported by these technologies, I think we need to also build a framework of trust so that they don't need to understand what is the distinction between a conversational versus gener generative AI. They don't need to understand the distinction between a blockchain or distributed ledger technology. 
they don't need to be bothered with those technology, technological details that are often too complicated to explain and to verbalize. They need to just be able to, to trust the solution and the entities, whether they are private, whether they are public, that are offering the solution. So I believe that uh, it's incumbent upon us working in this field to come together and start building bottom up and of course also top down a framework of generally accepted criteria and principles that can be utilized to then support the reliability, the trustworthiness of the solution and this technology where and if they are indeed implemented in healthcare or for that matter also another area of our society. So I think that there is that need to start now looking at the fact that I think as we all recognize, this powerful technology can be used for good or for bad. And not all solution have the same level of reliability. So there is a need to start having some sort of criteria that will enable us to start comparing and contrasting, to make assessment and to then providing a level of assurance that I think that ultimately that the human-centric approach calls for the user to deserve that what they are going to use is trustworthy and is reliable. Thank you. You know, thank you for raising this very important point of addressing this core issue of the human centricity plus reliability. I think it is a twin opportunity and a twin challenge too. Yeah. And this brings me to Samir. Samir, you, use the, you lead all the AI initiatives of WHO, and WHO is the multilateral body where every government looks up to. I think now there is an excitement across the world for generative AI and AI for health. Everyone is waking up. So what is your advice and the roadmap for the next one year, or the action plan, if I were to call it? Thank you, uh, Jendra. I, I, and you rightly said all the member states are actually getting very excited about this work, both from a Positive and negative side, and I said negative excitement is a scare or the fear of what damages can do, and the positive excitement is the opportunity. So I think there is, um, and, and we're seeing an unprecedented push from member states. Normally, um, there will be a two-way discussion, but the same member states are actually coming to us and asking, and not just now, um, since December last year, when actually Chad GPT started picking up the, the speed, um, and that's when it started off. So WHO actually through its process um, has put out a position uh, in the June WHO Bulletin uh, where we have clearly articulated the, the value possi possi possibilities of generative and uh, discussional uh, AI. Um, and, and in summary, I mean, the one sentence that summarizes that article for everyone here is, is WHO's position is to be cautiously optimistic and apply right safeguards. I mean, that's what we are saying here is, we have to be cautious, we have, we have to be optimistic. And as long as we have the right safeguards, and when I say safeguards, it is the ethics um, approaches. And now when I, ethics is a very common word. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a moral word almost to put out and discuss, but I think it's the application of ethical use, development and deployment of, of technology or AI specifically, more importantly, because, because AI has, has more power than before. Um, is a critical part, and WHO has guidance, which it's working with its countries to deploy. So it's, it needs to be a not a knee-jerk reaction, but a more sustained governance approach for AI, because AI is here to stay. It's already with us. It will make a difference in the in the way things are going forward in terms of healthcare, in terms of development in general, in terms of education, agriculture. So I think what's important is we need to take a Detailed, systematic, creative approach um, in in this in this regards. Also, regulations. I mean, we don't want to have regulations again becomes the the whip uh, for 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 our times uh, for the developers. But what we want to make sure is the regulations are there to safeguard 
and provide guardrails for the right technology and the right products to be deployed across the domain. And I think this is also humbling this time to see that it's not just coming from the countries, but it's also coming from the developers, the industry, the private sector. Um, you, I mean, the recent discussions at the US Senate uh, through some all the CEOs, where there's a call for regulating AI through the governments of the UN. I was in Copenhagen just last week where there was discussion of the UN High Level Commission um, of programs on AI regulations and governance. And there's a huge push from the Secretary General on, on sort of putting this work together. So I think that's the area of work where the world is going towards, and we will need to prioritize that. Again, keeping in mind that it has to be people-centered, not technology-centered. So the regulations, the ethics should not be technology-controlled or centered, but people-centered. How does it make an impact? And they have to be adaptable for different countries. As you mentioned, 194 countries, there are different, different stages. Um, and again, for the first time, we're seeing a rather less gap in terms of preparedness between the high income and the low middle income country settings. Um, it doesn't, I mean, there is some probably parity there, but but there is still a, a similarity across the board. So I think it's important to, to manage that, um, use the, the power of collaboration. And I think that's what we're leveraging through the bridge show, through ITU's work. And I think the forum there, a lot of the colleagues from ITU are there to leverage what is existing as WHO, we're creating normative guidance, which is science-based, evidence-based, and deploying that um, that science-based ethical regulatory approaches. And my call for this community here, which has a mix of a lot of expertise, very grassroots workers who are working on, to ensure that the guidance that has been deployed or the, the products that are being used are not technology-centered. It has to be science-centered. And when I say that is the guidance which is there, the content which is coming in, into it should not be written by the developers. And this happens. Uh, developers pull out Google, take the content. They are more fancy towards the, the, the application part of it, not on the content. But I think as actual healthcare providers, our job is to make sure that, that the content is, is governed through the right full mechanisms, the processes is rightfully done. And technology is the enabler, which is a massive massive boon for the healthcare process. And if we can do that combination right, in the ethical and regulated fashion, pushing towards the right governance mechanism, I think we will have um, a successful uh, one year of, of AI. And I, I hope we can come back next year in this forum and say, we just talked about it uh, in 2023, but 2024, we are making impact. Back to you, Rajan. Thank you, Samir. I think in this IGF uh, annual forum, the 18th forum that's going on, we heard uh, we had the entire high-level panel that was constituted by the UN Secretary General at this meeting discussing AI. I think one of the things that I saw in this forum is that most of the sessions this time are on AI and generative AI and around uh, various guidelines. And you made this point of consciously optimistic and also about uh, regulations. But in a technology which is evolving, how can you regulate? I mean, do you think that it is AI that will itself regulate or, you know, there'll be just guidelines which people should follow? And I think the work that Ashish, what Mavish and others are doing, uh, will that be a good starting point? Because guideline keeps, gives you a general direction and doesn't stall innovation because regulation to a point can become like a hindrance to innovation. So I mean, do you think that we should stick to guidelines rather than regulation for now for next two, three years? It's a great question, Arendra. and I think it, it, there's no blanket answer to it. I think even the European Commission uh, EU Act is looking at segregating the different ways that we regulate products. And so I think it depends a lot on the solution, on what kind of solution we're talking about, and what is the impact of that solution to define whether we can work with guidelines or, or regulations are needed to do that. And I think it, it's very centric. So let me give an example. For tobacco control or diabetes prevention and management, um, it is for prevention. There is a lot of content which is available. These are healthcare programs which have provided this guidance, which don't have the outreach. I think such simple guidelines, guidance-driven uh, programs for health education, personally, I think can be very quickly distributed if the there is a small mechanism of, of testing the right content in there. There is a, a risk on the hindsight that if you don't control or regulate these content, this can damage by providing misinformation uh, in that, which is a big uh, concern. So 
there are some products which I think can be loosely regulated, guidelines driven, but there are some specific areas where cancer screening products, where there, there are more um, retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy screening programs, where it needs to be regulated in a way. Now, I, I get this dialogue all the time in discussion whether regulations is over controlling innovation. And I think that's the thin line where we have to draw how does the value, I think the member states or the countries want to use the value. They have seen the problems that they have and how technology can help that. So I think the intentions this time are around more focused on how can we maximize the value of technology, but at the same time having that regulation is important because without regulation, there's a massive risk of misappropriation, misuse. So I think the regulation, the level of regulation and the control of regulation needs to be properly adapted and agile and defined. But it is important to make sure that we are not transforcing ourselves into an open um, sort of platform where anyone can do anything around healthcare, especially in healthcare. And I ask this question to people, would you say the same thing around when it comes to your financing? Would you allow non-regulated financial digital models to work across the board? And, and would you be open to doing that? Health is, is two domains further. So people are more worried about the money uh, than the health, unfortunately. And, and, and that's where the answer comes in. I think it is important to be able to regulate rightfully so we can benefit the value of the technology opportunities, but at the same time, control or safeguard the damage it could cause in the long run. But Samir, even after the Sarbanes-Oxley Act in the financial markets, we had the subprime crisis. We had banks collapse even a few years back, even this year, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. So I think uh, even if you over-regulate, we have the outcomes. I mean, wherever there's money involved, there would be, uh, I think you made this very interesting point in the very beginning, and I really appreciate you for that forthrightness is to not get into the trap of the private sector. So, but I think the experience of over-regulation hasn't served the purpose. I mean, uh, that has kind of been the uh, government's way of putting it, saying we are pro-people, so we need to safeguard them, but neither the safeguard the people nor the organization. At the end of the day, the sector bleeds. But uh, I take your point. Uh, coming to the fact of uh, point that you said about people centricity or people having trust in, and ethics about it, so I would go to Sabin, who is actually building at world scale so, I mean, what I understand from my experience of leading consumer-facing organization is that trust is a matter of value. So if I get value out of humans.ai, I would love it. If I get value and benefit out of the products and services you roll out in AI, generative AI, anything, that would create trust. So what would you think about the conversational AI product or healthcare in general in terms of using AI to create that value for creating that trust, because value is the precursor for trust, not the other way around. I'm 100% sure that the technology is here, so it's not a problem of technology anymore. Even us on this round table, we have all the resources to start experimenting with the project. I believe a lot in learning by doing. I believe that if we will have together as a group one use case, we will help the regulators to better understand and we can fill this gap between um, real world and, uh, and uh, the regulation of, uh, of, of the, the area. So I will choose uh, the easiest win that we can get probably in the aftercare. For example, we have a project with a big pharma company. We saw that in our region, it's a huge dropout rate so people are not finishing their treatments. After three days, they're feeling better and they stop taking their uh, antibiotics. So what we are doing, we are cloning the doctor voices because the doctor is the only authority in your life when you're speaking about medical um, uh, treatments. So we are sending uh, audio messages on WhatsApp with the voice of the doctor saying, hey, Sabine, I know that it's day three and you're feeling better, but it's important to finish the... So what I'm saying is, if we together, we will implement only one solution and we will choose one region, we will learn a lot and we will learn um, from the real world what, we ha what, what, our, what were our initial ideas and what the real use case 
uh, outputs really look like. So I'm willing to help with our technology and our team and our expertise to create together a real life use case, use case in conversation and AI for healthcare. And in one year from now, we will know more that we know uh, now. And Simon, would I take the liberty to say your message on your behalf, what you always say is, for AI start now, do something, rather than just thinking about it. Exactly, the technology is here, we have all the skills, I see a lot of passionate people about the subject, so we need to start, uh, start doing. And that's the best message, and I really re remember the line that you said last time, that when you, when you heard yourself speak in Portuguese, you know, you were able to <laughs> actually check, you know, uh, what uh, phenomenal opportunities exist before us, and the project that you're doing where you clone doctor's voice and, you know, uh, convince the patients to carry on with the treatment. So. I think the fact is that conversational AI has multiple use cases. And so one of the things I understand, and we carefully picked up this panel, you know, it was not because of friendship. It was because of the complementary things that come to the table by thinkers and doers and regulators, you know, uh, who are critical to success of conversational AI. So that's why we have blockchain, we have AI, we have WHO, we have UC Davis, we have Academy of Digital Health Sciences, we have Shauna. So, this is, this is what is the beauty of this panel, is that we should be able to get into something decisive which we can measure over the next one year. Mavish, coming to you, the uh, fact that you run a couple of initiatives in digital health, what would your uh, action plan be for the next year? I believe conversational AI can actually serve as a powerful tool in patient engagement, educating people about the facts behind a particular health-related issue. As you rightly said, Dr. Gupta, imagine the effort that would go in typing and texting, but conversing would actually leave an important and exponential impact. We all know the time that doctor spends with patient is very less, but if we have a conversational AI, patients would be happy that they have been heard. And at, Digital health, at Academy of Digital Health Sciences, we are working on the report on generative health intelligence, and we will be releasing it soon, covering all these topics on the role generative health intelligence will play in shaping the future of health, healthcare intelligence. We will be happy to collaborate with you all. And I would also like to say that within the dynamic coalition of digital health, Dr. Gupta, you should take this stewardship in creating the global group because UN is the largest multi-stakeholder and a multilateral body and getting everyone under the roof to form a global generative health AI group and leaders where you have regulators, policymakers come together to give a direction to all stakeholders, doctors, hospitals, and the frontline health workers to understand how generative AI works, how to get trained on it, and how to deploy it. We already have a course on digital health at Digital Health Academy, and you can visit the website to know more about it. Thank you. Thanks, Mavish. Ashish, over to you after your grand initiative that you launched this week. Uh, what are the opportunities for stakeholders to work together? Because the worst thing that happens to health is we all keep doing our work in silos. We rarely connect, forget here, uh, and listen and come together to act. I mean, at, when I took over as chairman of the Dynamic Coalition on Digital Health at the UN's IGF, one of the things I have done over this last one year is to get all the people in the same, uh, I would say, wavelength, pick up a project and, you know, deliver it. So every year for all the Dynamic Coalitions that at least I chair, we come with tangible outcomes every year. So given your leadership and, you know, your pioneering work, what do you suggest we should be doing in the next one year? We heard your previous experts from their position of authority and influence. No, happy to. I think one of the critical things is I think it's the onus is on us. Uh, there is a very um, a famous uh, map called Gat Gartner Hype Cycle, uh, where it shows about all the technology that comes. There is a the hype peak that happens. Then there is a uh, a valley of disillusionment or valley of death. Uh, and then there's a second wave which comes later on. And generative AI is now at the peak of that hype right now. But we all know there's a value. So, so where I would uh, uh, echo is uh, the transformation peak that is a second peak that is slower that happens after the valley of death is the true peak. And that is one as humans, we don't just look at technology, what it can do 
but actually we start learning how to use the technology for the right use cases within a, our workflows in a trustworthy, scalable, scientific manner. So it's repeatable, replicable, right? And that's what science role is, right? It takes what one person may say, but actually validates that approach across multiple different variations. So you can be fairly confident. For example, if I give this blood pressure medicine, this is gonna be the impact on it because it's been repeated replicable success. So we need to go the same thing with AI. We need to have that lens, similar to what Samir mentioned, put that scientific evidence-based lens um, and then see if something Sabine is doing great, can we replicate that across country? And can we demystify that through a playbook? We call it an implementation science playbook. So through Valid AI, uh, 30 health systems, health plans have got together. We have three global partners right now uh, in Israel, India, as well as in Canada. But our goal working, I love the suggestion which uh, uh, Mavish mentioned is creating this global thought leadership group on genetic AI in healthcare. We love to contribute our collective knowledge from US through valid and coalition of healthcare AI into it. Uh, so we can all learn from each other faster. Uh, we can also support each other best practices. Um, and also maybe uh, the ecosystem not only just had to be scientific, but also equal input from our key ecosystem partners, including startups, bigger technology, pharma. So we hear from them. So if we have to do a balanced approach um, uh, we don't err on the side of caution necessarily, but err on the side of optimism combined with caution and have feedback from all quadrants. I totally agree with you, Ashish. I think it's a great approach to make sure that the excitement is also backed by competence. And for that, everyone needs to work together. And I think Samir, Sabin, Mavish, uh, and uh, Dinu has very carefully told that not only these are the uh, challenges, but there are also technical solutions, you know, which are there. And I think the line that uh, Dinu put it, which is, which sums up the challenge plus opportunity, probabilistic plus deterministic, as simple as that. And both the solutions exist at scale. I mean, he is sitting where he has deployed, how many countries is this, Dinu? What do you have done for the pensioners? 192. 192 countries. We have Samir Pujari sitting here, 194 countries. We have Ashish Atreja, 15 systems. Mevish running a course globally. I think Dr. Ola Besi, I'm going to come to her next. Like you have everything on this current, uh, you know, um, the uh, screen where everyone who is an influencer at large and a doer both, which is a rare combination. And we know, I think the Gartner hype cycle, see sometimes those historical rules and uh, equations also get challenged. We should challenge the Gartner hype cycle and we should actually make it hope and heal cycle. You know, there is a hope, let's use it for healing. I mean, as simple as that. So Dr. Olavesi, you have heard all those people, you have used technologies and was very impressed to see these six month pictures of the babies. So given what you have heard, what do you need sitting there in Lagos, you know, from people on the screen to take your work to the next level? What should we be doing? What you should be doing? Over to you. Thank you very much for um, that question. With this um, WhatsApp that platform that we have with the mothers, I can see a lot of gaps because when the mothers send the pictures or type their questions, it's not real time. I might not see it at that point in time, but conversational AI, it's real time, you know, and it's all the, the true machine learning, the responses that are appropriate, that are relevant, comes to the patient immediately. Unlike me, it might be hours before I listen to that. So I can see the advantage of that, uh, of what we are doing, but I can also see a lot of gaps. And it's not personalized, it's open to everybody, the 300 and so patients on that platform. It's not personalized, They're, it's not real time. Sometimes it's not appropriate, you know, because when they ask a question on cough, I use the opportunity to just talk generally so that everybody picks something, everybody gains something. Yeah, so um, I think that's where, that's, that's the next step for me. We have to go away from this platform 
which seems so basic to me and see how we can introduce AI into it and take it to the next level. So listening to before our session, I was hearing Metaverse, you know, we, we, we have to um, collaborate and take from what everybody has learned. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Technology has gone far. You know, we're talking AI, we're talking um, conversational AI. We need to collaborate and take this platform to the next level because uh, patient outcome is important. Quality of care is important. Patient safety is important. And these are all issues that um, conversational AI will have an impact on. So this time next year, I don't want to be talking about WhatsApp. I want to go for, to the next level. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Olavisi. And I assure you that one of the things that we promise as a tangible outcome of this year's uh, panel on conversational AI would be to make sure that you next time present how we helped you reach the next level. That's a very big challenge. But if you're not able to make a difference on the ground, we are a fancy organization and we are not that. We actually mean results and we will do. So that's why it was a reason to have you uh, given the work that you are doing in actual LMICs, as we would call them. And if you are able to make a difference to your working as a clinician, we would have succeeded in delivering or walking our talk. Otherwise, it's just a mere discussion, which we will not intend to. Uh, coming to Shauna, Shauna has led a uh, global project, and we are very impressed that I know a few years back, the only project at scale for in AI was IBM Watson. So Shauna, you have an experience, you have reflections, uh, given the journey of IBM Watson, given what we are talking now, what would be your guidance for this group for what we are talking about tangible outcomes for next year? Okay. You know, I think that the kind of my reflections, honestly, are this is an extremely complex, pro complex problem in general. And it doesn't have to do with just conversational AI. So as you stand back, look at all of the different aspects that makes the individual vulnerable. I think one of the concerns that I have is something that you had brought up, the 2.6 billion people who don't have access to the internet. We need to continue to move forward with conversational AI, but we also need to make sure that those 2.6 billion people get access to the internet and to uh, that reliable connectivity to the information. Because if we create all these chatbots and do all this amazing work and they can't access it, then it's really not gonna do us much good. Um, uh, to really, you know, make that big of a difference that I know that you all want to make. Um, I think that that would probably be my, my main thing that would concern me that I would probably add beyond what the other speakers have mentioned, because that complexity uh, really does take it to a really top level, and we need to look holistically at the individual and what their needs are. Uh, so that they can get access and what we can do uniquely. Um, one of the things we did with IBM Watson is to set it up in various villages to where everyone would come to one location. So there are opportunities that individuals don't need just even a cell phone, but providing access where it's walkable to them, you know, within a few miles or, or even many miles, but at least within like half a day to be able to get access to this remote medical information. Thank you, Shana. Now we will move to the questions that we I see on the chat. What is the potential for training and learning best health practices? So on the training side, at least what I can mention about is that we have courses on digital health at every level for doctors. I mean, there's a postgraduate certificate course. So you can look up digitalacademy.health. We have courses for health professionals. But what we are also coming up, which is very interesting is Courses on AI and robotics for class eight students with Triple IT Delhi we have tied up, you know, is that we need to educate people at the bottom, you know, right from class eight onwards where they start learning about it. And this is the elementary course. And then what also we are launching early next year is the frontline health workers course. If they are not educated, we're not going anywhere. So that's on the training side. On the best practices side, I would put this question to Samir Pujari, given that WHO is probably one of the best platforms uh, you know, to look at, or even the Dynamic Coalition on Digital Health, you know, to look at collaborating with Samir on the best practices on AI, for conversational AI. Samir, over to you.
Can you unmute Samir Pujari, please? Well, in the high, sorry, there was a lapse in the in the network connection for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want to mention that on the on the training part, WHO has converted the guidance that they have created in the last year, and, and there is an open WHO course available on ethics and governance of AI. And this is not just a theoretical course; it has a very practical checklist and approach. And I put that in the chat, the the link to the course, which has been taken by more than one seventy thousand people. Uh, across 170 countries uh, virtually. So I think that's one of the solutions, but I think or one of the products which is there, we are coming up with a course specifically for developers because uh, it's important for this community to understand what it means to uh, create an ethical approach. And this course will be going live by the end of the year. We are having similar courses coming up on the regulations side as well. And these are targeted to developers, to policymakers, and to implementers. So there are checklists and application sort of processes for each of them within this course materials. Uh, these are being used by academic institutions across the globe to, uh, to train uh, students on, on healthcare provisions and AI. So these are some of the ways that it is there. But again, I keep on reiterating these things. Let's not, let's not recreate the wheel. Let's join hands. There's content available and we can deploy as many ways as we can through the process. Back to you. Thanks, Samir. Uh Ashish, over to you. This is an interesting question. Is the role of conversational AI in dispelling superstitions and health fallacies? That's that's a great one. Uh, you know, I, I think there is a clause that if you're not intentional about something, then that's not going to happen. So which means we do know there is a lot of misperceptions in healthcare. We saw in COVID what happened. Uh, and if we just leave at this, like in social media, WhatsApp or others, there's a lot of chance of things going viral, which are not accurate. And what we realized in COVID was clinicians, researchers actually had, did not have much voice because it was vir most viral content was the one which was the least trusted content from clinicians. So I think part of this is, is coming back to this stuff is the onus is on us to put science as a base Right. So, uh, so when technology solutions are created, and because it's democratizing technology, anyone can within a week learn using these technologies to create a bot, and and to do it. Uh, that may not be validated, or you know, and many times are not if it comes out so early. So we have to put kind of some framework. Um, uh, one can call it guard. If it is very life-threatening things, we have to put very rigorous guardrails. So FDA, Food and Drug Administration in U.S. has a three-point system. If it is a life-threatening system thing that has to go through much more clinical evidence, multiple clinical trials. If it is moderate risk, then certain kind of a thing. If it is very low risk, then it can go without major clinical trial. So we need to have some kind of a framework like that. If it is an education content, can we even use generative AI to validate some of the content which may come out. If we create a, a generative AI, not on large language models on the internet, because then it will hallucinate, but can we create the large language model on Harrison's medical of textbook, which I got trained on? Can we train get on WHO practices, on VA practices, open domain content from, uh, from US, UK, developing countries, WHO, wherever it is, on textbooks? then we actually may have an automated way or semi automated way to check the accuracy of it, put some delimiters, maybe backing with human in the loop for critical things. So I think that framework is not here right now, but we, we need to go beyond, uh, Dr. Gupta, as you mentioned, from traditional ways of regulating to actually maybe semi-automated bot ways of regulating. I was in a security summit and gave a keynote there, and where the, it ended was, they're going to be more and more bots on the trying to hack information now. So right now, humans do these bots to kind of get into security and hacking. With generative AI, it's going to be bots that are going to be doing it. So we need to dwell bots which are going to be protecting us uh, in that. And, you know, so, so the similar thing we have to do, we may not be able to do this governance just by humans alone. We have to go one too many and automated governance 
backed by humans look to allow that too. Thanks, Ashish. And I think the point that you raise is very important. I think is the Dynamic Coalition for Digital Health at the UN's IPF. One of the things I would add to what Mavish proposed was not only the generative health AI, but also generative health AI governance uh, framework. I think if I'm sure there are multiple, but we need to come out with something which is understandable, implementable uh, over the next uh, year or so. I have an interesting question that I would pose to Sabin is, how can conversational AI technology be made more accessible to people in low income areas who may have limited access to smartphone or the internet? I did, I know did, you did had a passing reference to this Sabin, but you would like to add something on this? Um, yeah, at least we need the um, an internet connection if you want to have access to powerful powerful uh, models, but uh, uh, they are models very efficient that you can run it not on a tablet but only on a mobile phone. Uh, but I see something like the digital doctor of the village that encapsulate the knowledge from all of the doctors from all around the world. And basically you need one mobile phone for for every village. So this is the minimum resource that uh, everybody everybody needs. I like another question, to what extent can conversational AI pose a threat to employment? Uh, I'm always saying, and I said it before, I think that AI, AI is not going to take your job, but a human using AI will take your job for sure. Probably using AI, uh, employers will work only two or three days per week and we will achieve 10 times more uh, more results in the same time you know that it's a big problem in in healthcare in general uh, that the human error and AI can supervise this so imagine that you will do your job having maybe 100 AI assistant helping you perform perform better so I, I don't see any any threat for for employment and I mean I will add to that that in the other dynamic coalition on internet and jobs. Uh, we had a session yesterday on uh, Project CREATE. CREATE is collaborate to realize the employment and entrepreneurship for all through technology ecosystem. In fact, we have create job, created job maps for nine sectors. And we have talked about the conventional models of doing a business and the CREATE model. So let's not fear technology. I think technology is best used for creating jobs than taking away jobs. And this project create is about that. So I would say, look up this website called projectcreate.tech. Uh, we have released, we are releasing our uh, framework tomorrow afternoon at IGF on project create. So the, while the uh, threat is not for jobs, the threat is to lack of competence. I would put it this way. So I would say upskill yourself, be competent, if you're not competent, anyone can threaten you, not only AI. So I would say that please upskill, continuously upskill, cross-skill yourself, and that's important. So there is no threat to you if you are updated and upskilled. Well, if you are not, you certainly have. Uh, Sabin, you're trying to say something? I agree, I agree. Thank you. Let's look at the other questions that are there. Where can we access the recording of this conference? Is there on YouTube? IGF broadcast that on YouTube, so it's available for people to watch. There is a comment, I guess. I believe youth-mediated initiative would help bridge the digital literacy gaps. Yes, of course. And uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, yesterday we were surprised to have a digital health session by the youth and boy, youth tech and boy of the ITU, and she is keen to work with the DC Digital Health to address this big issue of youth's involvement in digital health and DC. There's another question. Ashish's comment on, I am hoping science, which is evidence-based, uh, validated, repeatable, replicable outcomes and transparency ethical approach can help build trust along with great patient experience. Yes, Ashish, totally agree with you. And that is what I think this group should be working on on the governance and the outcome. So by the way, on the other side with the, the uh, International Standards Association, we are working on the outcomes measures using technology. I think uh, Dr. N.K. Singh from my team is going to make a presentation to the meeting in uh, Arlington. I guess it's next month on the how to measure clinical outcomes of technology-driven initiatives. And we're especially talking of digital therapeutics, which 
is being led by health parliament at the uh, it, uh, the it's called the uh, bureau of indian standards which represents the uh, isi the international standards uh, body so this was a great session uh, we are up our time and i thank each one of you for taking our time in different time zones and enriching us on conversational ai giving us a pathway for next year uh, i also thank our technical team at igf for making this session seamless for us thank you all so much and we will connect back in the meantime and hopefully next year we'll come back with the tangible outcomes we discussed the goal would be dr olabesi should benefit of all we talked that would be the goal for us thank you so much Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gupta. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all.